Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Guest today is Ste Stephanie Herbert. Stephanie, you ready to be great today? Yep. So, Stephanie, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited you invited me. Yeah, I've been following Stephanie for a while on social media. And she's not that active anymore, but she's active up on there, giving a lot of great knowledge and, and value on there. So, Stephanie, first a uh, uh, softball question. What do you do for fun? Uh, all kinds of things. I live out in rural Pennsylvania now, so I do a lot of hiking and I get to like have a garden now. And so it's the spring. It's it's the height of gardening season. So that's what I've been up to lately. Um, next, let's talk about your art. You actually have art as a, you actually sell your pieces as, as, as part of like a part-time business, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So what are you interested in? Are you something you've been in all your life? This is a recent thing you're doing. It's something I've been interested in all my life, but when I was a kid, I was always told, don't do that. You won't make any money doing that, which is, you know, uh, part partly true, I suppose. Um, but uh, but yeah, I've been into it all my life, and I'm glad that I get to do it now. Is it funny, like, when you're, when you're a kid, or whatever case, everyone says, don't do that because you can't make any money. But you think about it, I don't care what industry you pick, like, I don't care if you're a startup person, a lawyer, doctor, artist, guitarist, whatever it is, it's always hard to make money, right? Like only the top 1% actually make real money, right? Like even you're a doctor, if you're not like one top percent doctor, you're not making real money, right? I always thought it's that criticism. True. It's true. I think tech is a little bit easier in some ways, but even then, like I, I've known people who've struggled for years to get into the industry and it's, it's always, it's always difficult, you know? So what, what do you do for art? I saw some of your pieces. Are you mainly a painter? Do you do any sculpture? Um, I, in the, the first thing I did for money was programming art. So I actually worked full time doing this for a company. I would uh, do art installations for big businesses in their lobbies and, you know, make them look all fancy at conferences. And so that was uh, like digital art stuff um, and it used programming. Then when I started selling my own pieces, I did photography, painting, all that as well. But um, I also do the digital art still. So what is it you, that you like about art? It's just like, is the peace of mind uh, something else you do besides your tech career? I think it's 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 a little bit of everything. It's nice uh, just from a therapeutic angle, but it's also nice to connect with people in a way that, um, I don't know, makes them feel like happy and inspired. And it's it's a different way of connecting with someone than like my tech business where like I make their app faster, which is great, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> it's like a different side of it. It's nice, it's nice to touch people like emotionally. My maybe my compression software touches some people emotionally. <laughs> so when you, when, you, when you start to do a piece, does someone tell you what they want or do you have your own idea and then and, and go through your process, get your piece of art, then sell it? If it's a if it's a commission piece, like if uh if a client is hiring me to do something, they all get to direct a lot of the direction. But when it's me, yeah, I'll I'll do it and I'll try to see what sells. It's it's honestly kind of an experimental business at this point. I do a little bit of everything. There's not a there's not a formula like there kind of is in my other business. And do you have a goal like make a certain number of pieces each year or just whatever you do, you do? My goal with my art business is to stay happy while selling art. Okay. And so I feel like I could go in various directions that would make me more money, but I know that I would be burnt out or I don't enjoy doing those paths as much. So I'm taking it real casual, real slow, and just trying different things and seeing if I can find that sweet spot where I really enjoy doing something and it also makes money. And you that, also I think that's the hard part. Yeah. And you yeah. also enjoy baking and cooking too, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so like, what you have like a favorite food to cook or just all kinds? I love cakes. cakes. I, I, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be baking a birthday cake soon. I'm going to make it like a chocolate espresso birthday cake. It'll be fun. So what's like the craziest cake you ever made? Like, you know, like <laughs> chocolate with purple cream or, you know, some kind of crazy feeling. I don't do anything. I don't do anything that wild. I just, I just, uh, I just really enjoy the process and, um, and, uh, and yeah, I think, I don't know, maybe the weirdest, it's not weird. I, I like, I like making all kinds of gigs. And then you also do a lot of hiking, right? 
Yes. Yeah. Of course, Seattle hiking. is like the freaking hiking capital of the world, probably. How's the yes, hiking in Pennsylvania? I loved it when I lived there. I loved, I loved um, all the hiking spots you could get to. How's the hiking there? You still do a lot of hiking in Pennsylvania? It's different. Um, it's different because what Seattle would call a hill, we call a mountain. And so <laughs> it's it's really cool though, because I get to climb these hills and be like, I summited a mountain today. And everyone's mm -hmm. like, wow, you know? And so yeah. I get to go up like 1500 feet or something and, and it feels very accomplished. Yeah, Seattle, I learned quickly, like, you got to be careful when you go hiking with someone, because it it's an easy hike, it's 20, it's, it's two miles, the two miles I are, like, know. straight up like that, right? I know, I, I, I quickly learned, I, I stopped going on, like, group hiking trips in Seattle, because I love hiking, but I'm not, like, an athlete, so, like, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna scale that mountain very fast, but I'll, I'll go at my own pace. Yeah, so, so you, how often you go hiking now? Uh, I try to go once every other week or so, or once okay. every week, but there's like, there are forests nearby where you can just go and sit. You don't have to like go on a hike, but okay. yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. How long have you been hiking? Like for a long time, like we get interested in it. Uh, since I was a kid, I was hiking, okay. you know? Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, but when I was in my twenties, I was working too much to hike. So uh -huh. it's, it's nice to, um, actually be able to get out there. And then I, I read, you also into reality TV, like what, yes. what's your, what's your, what are some of your TV shows you watch? Uh, all, all kinds. Uh, I, I'm excited for the next, uh, season of Love Island, which is premiering this summer. Okay. What's your favorite one so far? I mean, there's like me as a them on TV recently. I, I don't take it that serious. Like, that's the thing about it is it's not like, oh, this has changed my life. It's just like, you know, it's just shows to unwind to. So I would say like, you know, things like Love Island or Too Hot to Handle or something. It's just funny. It's just nice to have a hobby that's, you know, but it's not serious, yeah. you know? Yeah, like a guilty pleasure almost. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I was listening to a podcast you did a while ago. And someone in there described you as being unapologetically positive. Is that, is that, true? Is that still true? Uh, maybe. I think um, I try to be, but um, I don't know when that podcast was. But uh, I feel like, you know, I can be critical when I need to be. Mm. You have a good balance. Yeah, you got you got to. If you're if you're too positive all the time, you'll miss the the. The things you maybe should avoid, you know? Yeah. I always say, like, if you're, like, negative every single day, like, there's something wrong with you. I always say... Yeah, you can't you can't be too negative either. But I also say, if you're, like, unicorns and rainbows every day and lollipops every day, there's something wrong with you too, right? Like, you gotta have a balance. Like, if every day you wake up, most unicorns and rainbows, the greatest day ever. Like Exactly. Maybe. I think I think I used to be um, overly optimistic to the point where I would stay in situations that were maybe not the best for me because I saw the best in the situation. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, this, you know, I can see the good in this. And it's like sometimes you just got to leave, you know? Yes. So how do you take care of your personal development? Like, how do you make sure you still keep on top of things that you need to keep part of or tech or art? Or anything else in your life like what's your plan what, what do you do for your own personal development um for me i think uh, things like therapy are a big part of it and uh taking care of my mental health and physical health and uh sticking to routines um and just making sure i think this is especially true in things like hobbies and art where like, if I need to rest, rest, you know, don't try to make it like a hustle or a grind where you're doing it even when you hate it, you know, like I try to really listen to my body and listen to my mind and try to take those signals seriously to avoid burnout. Yeah, I think it's fun to listen to your body, right? So many people like, I work eight hours a week or I do whatever the case be, you know, four days a week, but I think you need to listen to your body, right? Like, like, if you're hungry, go eat, right? We need a rest, take a rest, tonight, right? I mean, of course, sometimes you got to push through, you know, suck it up, so to speak, you know, because stuff has to be done. But if you're doing that every day, that, that can't be good for you. It's not a sustainable thing. But I think you're right. There are some days where you just got to do it. You have a deadline. Like, it's like, and those are the days where you can use that kind of persistence. But I think on the normal days, it's it's better to take it easy. Yeah. And um, so how do you take care of your mental health? Uh, all kinds. I think. Um, a therapist once told me that like happiness and calmness and fulfillment is not 
achieved with like one or two things it's usually like a hundred little things throughout the day and so like you know um like taking a walk in the morning making sure your house is clean making sure you have food like all those all those little small things that we might ignore um uh, I think are really important so I I try to keep a reasonable schedule and um eat well and sleep and all that and also pay attention to the small things so back in the day, actually pretty recently, it was like kind of like taboo to go to, to say you went to physiotherapy, right? No one to physiotherapy. If you did, you better not admit it, right? Because you're seen as weak. That's obviously yeah. changed. That's changed big time, which is for the good thing. What made you like, okay, actually go to physiotherapy? Uh, I think I went through, I went, I started going seriously to therapy in 2017. So it's been what, six years, five or six years now. Um, and I think I just hit a wall. I I had always had the mindset that if I was determined enough and, you know, persistent enough and I just sucked it up, like I could do it. <laughs> like I, and I just hit a wall where I no longer could work and I no longer could get things done and like scaring myself into doing it or being determined wasn't working anymore. And I think at that point, like you got to admit that like the old ways aren't working, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's had to be a balance, right? Like, on one hand, you know, you can't push through every single thing, you know, then again, you know, like you can't like, you know, every single time something goes your way, you know, take the weak way out, so to speak. I know they're in the world, yes. right? That's be, that's be some kind of balance, right? Yes. You can't run away from everything, but I think learning when you should ask for help, I think is important. Um, and learning when you should rest and, and all that kind of stuff is important, but you don't want to rest all the time and you don't always want to be dependent on everybody else. Uh, but there's, there's a balance. So you went to physical therapy the first time, do you have to like deal with your ego or pride or anything? Like, you know, I'm stronger than this. I'm not weak. I can't, I, I shouldn't go to therapy that do the ego and pride thing, anything in that. I think, I think everybody probably experiences that. I think I, I kind of grew up with a very like tough mentality of like, I can, if I just, you know, just suck it up, just go, just, it just, I worked way too much, especially in my early twenties. I worked all the time. Um, and I think, I think I, I had to kind of let go. I think the hardest thing for me was learning to rest. I think that's what hit my pride the most is learning to stop and take a step back because I always admired people that worked a lot and did a bunch of stuff. And I, I had to kind of reframe that and be like, I don't want to be somebody that does too much. I don't want to be that anymore. You know? Yeah. I mean, cause you gotta be mentally strong as a, in a, as a startup, right? Cause you're going to hear no 20,000 times, anything you do, like, like sales and marketing and public speaking, you know, job interview and hear no all the time. So you gotta be mentally strong. However, like I said, however, comma, like what's the point where you're like, okay, I, I need some help. Exactly, exactly. And I, th I think you can relate to this too, right? It's just you, you got to be you got to be persistent and independent and headstrong, but also like that can also damage you too. So it's 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 a balance. It's a balance there. Yeah. yeah. So um, we're gonna go way back in the day. I found a YouTube video that you did when you were back at Evergreen State College talking oh about connected <laughs> learning. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? What is connected learning? And, and also talk about your Evergreen State experience, because that's kind of like a different college, right? Yeah, so I went to kind of like an alternative school. There were good and bad things about it, but um, I think uh, one of the good things about it was that there was no grades. There was no, um, there was not um, some of the pressure that other schools have. I went to kind of like an intense high school where like it was very stressful and competitive and like not fun. And, <laughs> and, and this was a little more laid back and focused on, um, uh, interdisciplinary learning and like blending multiple subjects together and just it, it was a little more a little more chill which was which I think was good for me in that way now for people out there saying no grades I want to go to that school I, I, I excel right there even though there's no grades there's still like a different kind of pressure to succeed right there's still credits so yeah. they can take away the credit from you meaning like that's the equivalent of like failing a class so you're not guaranteed to get credits and on top of that they write like evaluations of you like paragraphs which are sometimes worse than grades because they like highlight what you didn't do well but I think overall I think it probably is more chill than a grades-based school where like people are really competing on a curve to get that a and you know pros and cons now, I might be making this up, but is it true that if you get a bachelor's degree from Evergreen State College, 
you have a hard time into a master's program because like, most schools don't recognize every three college like credit program or am I making that up? I don't know. I never tried for a master's program. Okay. I went straight. I went straight into um, full time work. And I think if I did a master's program at this point, I am ten years, ten plus years removed from college. Mm-hmm. I think they wouldn't even really look at it. They'd probably look at like my work experience. Okay. Yeah. And, um, I don't know about recently, but you used to do a lot of public speaking. Yeah. Can you talk about the importance of public speaking and putting yourself out there for any reason? Yeah, I think especially as a business owner, it was really helpful. Um, uh, And yeah, I think I I got to meet a lot of people and I even got to just know that I could do that, which which was nice, you know? Um, So natural public speaker, are you like most people like scared to death before they get on the stage and and just do it? I'm scared, but I do it anyway. (laughs) I'm somebody who I can look like I'm calm, even if I'm freaking out inside. So that's a benefit. Like I I don't, the nerves don't go away, but I can like maintain the facade that I'm somewhat calm. (laughs) Yeah. I know like, it's funny. Like sometimes I would like do some some kind of speaking thing and people are like, oh man, that's the, you did great. I'm thinking to myself, that was the worst fucking thing ever done in my life. Like I know, you, right? Like, how do you I, understand I what I that. said? Yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of times it's like you talk, you give a speech, like you don't remember half the things you said. Like you rehearse, rehearse, but then half the things you remember you say, half the things you don't, it's, it's just weird. Yeah, yeah. So next, talk about a thing I found. It's called Open Source and Open Standards in VR that you did. Yeah, um, I, I can, we continue to do a lot of like open source work um and when I lived in Seattle I was a big part of like the VR community and it was really it was really nice it was a really nice community at that time since then a lot of people have like moved away and done other things but uh it was nice to be a part of and try to like start from an early stage of the technology and see how we can maybe make it better in the future for those who don't know what is open source um open source is basically kind of The way I describe it to people sometimes is it's kind of like a library. Um, A library owns the books, but you can use the books and you can reference the books and you can build your own things from the knowledge in the books. Open source is kind of like that. We own the software in in my business, but other people can use it and other people can build their own software with it. And we will just kind of be the maintainers. We'll be kind of the library of the software. And like, this is probably like a basic question, but with open source, how do you make sure no one's going in there like kind of trying to hack you or steal stuff or messing the code up? Is, I'm guessing you have like some kind of protections in there, some, some kind of yes. way. Yes, and it works different ways with different people. But with us, we are kind of uh, the only people that can edit our code. And so people can submit requests to edit it, but we get the approval on whether we want to take those changes in or not. But anybody can use it. Like people can download it, no problem. But if they want to edit it and like add it to the official repo, uh, that's that's more like gate kept by us. Okay. So next one. So I know like it's like a lot of startup founders in tech would have case be they focus on product, 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 you know, of doing the code from the product. And spend no time on sales or marketing or networking, right? But you, you gotta have like a you have to link it up, it has to be synced, right? All at the same time, sort of kinda. How do you personally make sure like you didn't work on one thing too much versus at the detriment of the other thing? I think that's where my business partner comes in. So my business partner's rich. Um, and he he's a very product focused person. Like he is, he is very into just developing products. And I think I'm usually the one to take a step back and say, okay, we need to sell this. What's our strategy? Like how maybe we shouldn't work on that, or maybe you should work on this more. So I get to take a step back and focus more on the business and sales where, whereas he gets to just go in product R and D land and like really focus on that. I think it's different when you're one person doing both things. I think that can actually be a real challenge sometimes. And y'all have been co-founders since the very beginning. Since the very beginning, since 2016, it's, it's been a while. And how do y'all meet each other? How do how do how tell us about how y'all two became co-founders? So we became friends in 2015, the year before. Um, I decided I wanted to leave full-time work 
And I was starting to freelance on my own. I was like, I'll just, I'll just freelance. I'll just do this. I don't want to work full time anymore. Um, and he was like, Hey, can I join you? And we just ended up working really, really well together. And we were like, we should build products too. We don't need to just freelance together. And um, so we started that way. So I know there's so many stories out there about co-founder breakup, you know, that going the wrong way. What are some reasons like you ought to have stayed together so long and still have a good rela working relationship? I know, right? Like somebody, a lot of founders have told me it's like getting married to somebody. And it's it's like, it, you are really, it's not like a coworker relationship at all. Like it's, it, it really is like, they could ruin things for you if they wanted to. They have access to your accounts and all kinds of stuff. So it's been, it's been hard at times, but I think- we have very similar values and i think that is really important for example we went through an experience of trying to bring on other co-founders at various points in our journey and you know some people were not okay with for instance having a lean year um like they needed to make like a certain amount of income every single year or else some people like really were obsessed with like growing the team like they wanted to have a hundred people and I think I think I think being um really aligned on that vision and those core values of like what we want to do has held us together even when we've gone through fights and other things because I think that both of us have kind of like unique values in in business here's one for you and, and don't don't tell us the details but like how did your co-founder determine like the equity each one of y'all are going to have? Uh, yeah. So we have, we share things 50, 50, like 50, 50. We talked about in the beginning, not doing that. Yeah. And everyone says don't do 50, 50, but it works for oh, you. Oh, really? Is that the yeah. common advice now? Yeah. Uh, I, we did it for relationship reasons at the end of the day. Uh, well, and, and it was because we both were investing full-time in the business. I think it might be different if one of us was like not really there. Like mm -hmm. if you have a co-founder that's like putting like barely any time in and you're doing most of the work, I could see that feeling really unfair. But we we really like, we're both invested in it as our main thing. And um, we did it for relationship reasons because I feel like, if I took, for instance, 40%, I would feel less valued. I would always have that in my mind that like, you don't think business is as important as your product development. That's messed up. Like it would always kind of rot in my brain, you know? And what was the degree from, uh, from college? Uh, computer science. Okay. Yeah. So, so what got you interested in tech? Was that something you interested like since elementary school days or you, something later on in life? No, I didn't want to go into tech. I wanted to be a mathematician. I went to school originally for math and I really like math, but I learned that the actual career path for math was not very fun. Like um, you can be a professor or you can work in finance. It's not as many options. And I, uh, uh, people suggested at the time, like go into computer science, like you can get a job much quicker. You don't need to get a PhD. And so I kind of went to computer science as like a practical route. So from your experience and being in tech for a little while, have a computer science degree. Mm -hmm. do, do you think people come for boot camps or people computer science degrees are more ready to go to go to a job and, and, and contribute right off the way, right off the bat? Uh, well, my co-founder doesn't have a degree. He's completely okay. self-taught. Like he okay. didn't even go to a boot camp or anything. Like he he just he learned it all himself. And so, and I have a degree in computer science. So we're kind of both of those sides. I think anybody is. I think the thing about our industry that's both good and bad is it's a lot of like who you know and like who you can get a foot in the door with. And I feel like I've seen people both with degrees and with boot camps be equally successful at that and also equally struggle with that. So I think I think it's it's just a tricky thing. Once you get your foot in your door, you're you're good. But it's how you kind of get into the industry that can be tricky. Yeah. I know a lot of junior developers are trying to struggle with it right now. Like a lot of junior yes. developers are having a hard to find the first job. Yes. Like they're like doing what they can, doing portfolios, all this networking stuff, and they can't get in. But then once they get in, it's like they'll go to right. Like I know, I know so many senior developers. It seems like they switch job year to year, getting paid more money. But the junior developers, yeah, it's it's not it sucks to be them right now. I mean, that's that's always been my experience. Is like 
some junior developers do get lucky. Like I got lucky. I got a job right out of college, but that was lucky. Like some people I know spend like three years looking for their first job. And I think it's important. It sucks, but I think it's important to recognize that like a lot of people go through that and that you just need to get in, you know? Yeah. So what is a low level graphics engineer? Yeah. So I deal with like very close to the hardware code, like assembly code, like like as close as you can get, as opposed to something like JavaScript or um, like a higher level language where you're, the hardware is a more abstract concept to you and you're just kind of trying to um, design things. And, and I, I deal a little more with performance and making apps run smoothly and making sure the hardware is getting talked to in the right way. So thinking back to when the days y'all first started a company, what's the challenge you had back then that like you really struggled with? But now you're like, I can't believe we struggled with this. This was so simple. What was wrong with us? Oh gosh. There's I feel like there's probably so many things like that. Um I mean, this is a boring answer, but one of those things was accounting, actually. Like I in the <laughs> beginning. <laughs> I tried to do everything myself and it was so, it, it stressed me out so much and I missed so many deadlines and I didn't know what forms to fill. And now we just have an accountant and, and our accountant saves us money. <laughs> like, and so I just push everything to our accountant and it's handled. And I, I struggled way too much in the beginning. And so y'all started your company as 2016 or 2017? Uh, 2016. 2016? Yeah. So you, so you started a company. When was the moment that came like, Y'all like, hey, this, this, we, this, we might actually have something here. Like, that, oh, I'm okay, this is gonna make some money, or we're gonna be proper, or this is actually a real business. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So we were getting freelance contracts pretty consistently in the beginning. So we knew, okay, we can at least do freelancing. Freelancing is at least a thing we can do. But we didn't know we could sell products, and freelancing can be kind of stressful. You know, you can kind of. Uh, have have periods where you're doing well and then periods where you can't find any contracts and it can, it can be very up and down too. Um, but in late 2016, uh, Netflix um, signed on to be our first customer of the product. They did a pre-order situation and that was a pretty substantial deal. And that was when we were like, okay, we have something. And then the next year when we started to get even more deals, we were like, okay, that wasn't a fluke. So it was pretty quick in terms of startups. Like I know some people take years to kind of get to that point, but we were lucky. Customers. Mm -hmm. like, how do y'all find your customers? Oh, how do we find our yeah. customers? Uh, it varies and it's changing even now. Like a few years ago, we were very, very social media based. Like we would post everything on social media and try to DM people. And it was very, very like that. We also would go to conferences and I would take meetings with all kinds of people. And um, and now it's a lot, it's a lot quieter now. I'm experimenting with more like, like, word of mouth kind of stuff and and more just standing back and not being as outreachy and I'm kind of experimenting with that because I used to be very outreachy and very like posting all the time and it's it's nice to take a step back and see if we can still get business this way too and who do y'all consider like your perfect customer that's a hard question because I think that we would be open we are open to a lot of different types of customers. I think it would come down more to, I think they would, they would need to have enough money to, to hire us. I think that's, that's important, but kind of like not as fun to talk about. And I think it would be somebody who we just were able to get along with. I think somebody who wasn't too, I, I deal with a lot of like very intense negotiations and it can be nice to find the customers who are, who are, who are more chill and a little more like understand small businesses. I think that's always really refreshing when a customer actually like understands our situation. Like, hey, I, I can pay you guys a couple weeks early or like, hey, do, maybe you should charge more. And and like just that kind of relationship is really refreshing. And so you, also, you do a lot of social media taking a step back. Was mm -hmm. there a, re was there a reason for this? Or you just like, we're on, like you said, we're on an experiment. We're doing a social media. Or was there a particular reason? I think it was a lot of things. I think... um. 
one of the reasons is, especially as a woman in this industry, it can be hard to be visible on social media. Like I, I, I had a trouble posting anything without negative comments. I, everything I posted had negative comments. And I think in the beginning, I was able to be like, I don't care. Like I'm going to post anyway. And eventually it kind of got to me. And it's, it's been really good for my mental health to be able to just live my life and not constantly get negative comments on it, you know? So like talk about the challenges of being a female in tech, right? Yeah. Some of the challenges of that pros and cons. Kinds. Like all kinds. Like I, um, I've dealt with like serious shit, like sexual assault. Like I've dealt with like less serious shit, like negative comments on Twitter that still get to me. I think I've dealt with a whole range of issues, uh, being a woman in tech and it's, 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 you know, it's, part of why I have a small business in rural Pennsylvania now and I can kind of <laughs> <laughs> step back and not need to interact with as many people. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's your advice to other females have gone through that? People who have gone through that or uh, people uh, who are thinking uh, uh, of getting No, them? other females have gone through those challenges. My, a lot of discussions I've been having lately have been around the theme of you don't need to be the martyr. Like you don't need to be the person to change the company. Like you can just find a company that's better from the get-go. I think a lot of people feel this like moral obligation to risk their own health and sanity to try to change some place. And I think that you don't always have to do that. And it sucks. And and you wish you could just change it, but it's not always worth the toll on your mental health. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. Uh, so next, I found this also, um, another podcast you did with this guy from Microsoft. It was giving back the role of ethics and open source to online communications. Online communities, I mean. Yeah, yeah. I I... I thought a lot about ethics throughout my career in various levels. Um, and, you know, it's part of why we're still a small business. I haven't figured out a way to hire a bunch of people or anything in a way that I feel comfortable with. And so just trying to treat people well, treat people the way I would want to be treated, you know. Um, and I think um, a lot of open source projects are also an opportunity to kind of practice that. Stephanie, what's some new tech out there that excites you right now? I don't know. There's a lot of exciting stuff. I've been into um, every single year. There are new uh, new electronics kits and new things they can do with electronics, like like um, little like just just new ways that you can emulate different old computers or uh, do like really cool installations with LEDs with a smaller and smaller computer. And it's it's just really cool for me to see like the Raspberry Pis and the Arduinos and, and that kind of world advance. Because I think there's a lot of opportunity in that. And I really like building like products around those devices. So do you consider yourself a hardware person or software person or combination? I am a combination. Combination, okay. Both. Yeah. So what's, so I know a lot of people say hardware is, of course, like, you know, they'll say hardware is harder, harder to do, right? Do you think that's true or is this a myth? I don't think so. I yeah. think, um, hmm. It's kind of like somebody saying math is harder than English. You know what I mean? Like yeah. maybe that maybe that's true for some people or maybe it's true for some people just because like everybody says math is hard and so they're scared. But I don't think I don't think objectively one is harder than the other. I think they're just different. It's just a different skill set. From your point of view, what are some pros and cons of being an entrepreneur? There I mean, a lot of people know about the cons, you know, uh it's it's in some ways like it's so weird because it's some in some ways it's more stable and in some ways it's less stable. It's more stable in the fact that I have never held a job for seven years. This is the longest running job I've ever had. So in some ways it's really, really stable, but in other ways, like, you know, you could lose all your business next year. You don't, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't, you don't know if people are suddenly just not going to be interested in your product anymore. And I feel like there's never like that true stability of like, yes, this will be in business forever. Even with really established companies, there's always, you know, give and take and push and pull. It's, it, it's yeah, both are true. 
Yeah, it drives me crazy when people say, well, I want to start a business, but I need the security of a corporate job. And then the next day, IBM lays off 50,000 people, you know, all these companies laying people off, right? There's no such thing as a secure job anymore, I don't think. That's the thing, is that, like, it it can feel that way, but is it that way? Like, they, most companies do at-will employment, so they mm -hmm. can literally fire you at any time. For any reason. For any reason. And so, <laughs> it's like, you could say, oh, they won't do that, but they can do that. And as they've opposed done in the past. To, like, owning your own business where you build up a roster of customers and you have that stability and you know, you can ask 10 different people for a job and, and, and like, you know, and you're more of a stable entity. You're not as reliant, but I, I, I get both arguments. Like some people find niches in companies where they know they're not going to get fired and they can stay there for a long time. I've never been able to find that in tech personally. Yeah. So next talk about what is texture compression in the future of VR? Yeah, so I uh, my business does uh, image and texture compression. So think things like JPEG or um, you know PNG, those kinds of formats. We build another format, and our format works really, really quickly. It can load an image way faster than anything else. And in VR, where you have images everywhere, or if you have a website that has um, tons of images on it, that loading speed really, really matters. So we excel in that. We make it just really performant when we use the GPU to do that. So the the company you have now, how did this come about, right? Is was your idea, your business partner's idea, a combination of like, what you're doing is like pretty like tech intense, I'm thinking. It's very intense. It's super intense. Um, it was a little bit of both. I, I have background in a, as a graphics programmer. So I knew that I, if we built a product, I would want it to be around that. But so did my business partner. And he's been building compressors since the 90s so he compressors are like his thing like that's what he does as opposed to me where i do a lot of things in graphics and so it kind of made sense to go in the compressor direction and we just had to figure out from a business sense what we could actually sell and you're like a small business right yeah it was just me and my business partner so and when you first started were, were there any plans like you know be like a, a a billion dollar tech unicorn, raise money for VCs, all these big dreams, things like that. Was always, the plan was always to be a small business. It was to stay a small business, for sure. We were open to the idea of like acquisition or something like that. Like that was a possibility, but we knew that we did not want to manage a hundred people. We did not want to do that. We just wanted, we wanted a lot of free time for ourselves. We wanted freedom. Like we wanted the freedom to have a very lean year without a hundred employees who need paychecks the next day. Like we wanted that like flexibility and freedom. And I think we also um, just felt better that way. It's nice to collaborate with other people on more of an equal footing and less of an employee employer relationship. And is it just you and your co-founder team? Or you have more members now? No, it's just me and my co-founder. Just, okay. just the two of us. And we we do have like an accountant and a bookkeeper that we work with who have their own businesses who help us, but it's it's us in the in the core team. All right. So you two y'all y'all do all the work, everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The the things we don't do are legal. I'm not a lawyer, accounting and and bookkeeping. Okay. And can you talk, I mean, not the nerd out too much. Can you tell me like some of the tech details of what y'all do, like the nerdy stuff about it, like how it works? Yeah, so uh, the way our texture format works is we take advantage of the fact that GPUs are very parallel. So GPUs basically have a bunch of different small caches and can do a lot of things at the same time, as opposed to CPUs, which have really big caches, but less of them. GPUs have a lot of small ones, so they can't hold a lot, but they can do so many simple things at the same time, which is why they're used a lot for like AI and things like that, that require a lot of parallel simple commands. And for us, what we do is we split our image up into lots of little blocks. And each block has a really small instruction set, and it allows it to be to process the image in lightning speed, as opposed to having just one thing that needed to be processed um, without that parallelization. So is there, is there a project out there that y'all don't want to work on, you haven't worked on yet, like something like super sexy, like I'll, I'll make this up like pose like Elon Musk said, hey, I want you to work on SpaceX for me or something like that. Or like any kind of crazy ideas out there you want like, man, I want to do that. The thing about 
about working in low level code is that they it never sounds sexy to anybody else like <laughs> but it's cool to me like we're thinking of exploring like lossless compression which would be more things like the zip format or like like uh shrinking anything a lossless compressor doesn't need to just work on images it can shrink any kind of file and we're looking on expanding into that and do you have a patent for all this stuff or is this like stuff that's common knowledge uh, can you see me real quick? Uh, yeah, it just turned off. Oh, do you want me to troubleshoot this or should I just kind of? Uh... Uh, either, whatever you want to do, you do both. Okay. It's back on. Well, no, it's uh, off. Okay, I can do this. Back. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, we've explored patents. So patents are actually a really interesting topic in the tech industry. They have caused a lot of problems in compression because what will happen is that people will patent things that everyone uses that are not new ideas that are super simple and the patent office does not understand this. And so it's like, oh, this is a new invention. Nobody can use it now. And so they will, they will patent really simple ideas. It's almost like patenting the idea of nails. Like nobody can use nails anymore <laughs> because I patented the nail and it's like, <laughs> so it's a very touchy topic in our field. Like if somebody gets a patent, they can kind of make themselves a villain in the field, but it can also make a lot of sense sometimes. Like, and so it's a very tricky balance. And we try to walk that line of not being jerks and not patenting things that like should not be patented. In those cases, we'll just open source that software. But we thought about how we can maybe do that in a less jerky way, basically. Now, how many years did you live in Seattle? Oh my gosh, off and on for like 10 years. I, I lived in Seattle for the for the majority of my 20s. Okay. So yeah. in Seattle, you were pretty involved in the tech star community, right? I used to do a lot of networking events, go to different events, right? Yeah. So I'm guessing there's not very many, there's probably not, not a very big tech, a tech startup scene where you are right now. No. Like, like <laughs> do you still, how do you stay in, in like touch with all the tech people? Like, do you still like do Zoom meetings or you pretty much like in a rural Pennsylvania doing your own thing? I'm three hours from New York City. So sometimes I will go there and kind of, they have, there's a really cool tech scene in Brooklyn actually. And I will go to Brooklyn and kind of meet some people there. I also have um, kind of an online community and discord that's like private that not everybody can join. And I can kind of like keep in touch with some people that way without exposing myself to all of people on the world yeah. um and then i also have set up like monthly or weekly or quarterly zoom calls with people i think it's good to keep in touch with people and i feel like people really underestimate the power of just catching up over zoom every month or so yes so who do you consider your mentors right now gosh I don't know. I think in some ways my business partner is a little bit of a mentor. Like we're, we're equal in some ways. And then he also uh, has a lot more years of experience than I do. So it's kind of like, it's interesting because I have, I, I'm better at like the business side than he is, but I also have a lot to learn from him on the tech side. So we kind of like are partners in that way. But other than him, I'm not sure. I don't think I have a lot of uh, mentors. And then are you mentoring anyone? Uh, I try to. I try to always be open to emails and messages that I get, and I'll I'll occasionally hope hop on like a Zoom call or check in on people. So absolutely. What do you advice you have for someone like you know that wants to break into tech as a career? It's tricky because it's so dependent on so many factors, right? Like. If they live in a big city like Seattle, it's going to be very different than if they live in a rural area, you know, right? And I think the general advice that I usually give is that uh, networking is really important in our industry and you can get a job by just applying, but a lot of the usual rules of job markets don't apply and people get jobs just from talking to people and knowing people and being at the right place at the right time. And um, I really wouldn't underestimate that. Like, it's not necessarily smart to apply for like 200 jobs blindly. <laughs> like you can, you can maybe spend your time better by like getting to know people and um, uh, trying to get in that way. And I think, I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize. The next one, how about advice for people who want to start their own company? 
it's normal for businesses to take a long time to make revenue. Like that's normal. Like it takes many entrepreneurs. And years. most people don't realize that. You know, they yeah. think in six months they're going to be Mark Zuckerberg is so far from the truth. Or they think if they can't be that in six months, they must be a horrible business person and they failed and they can't do it. And I think you have to realize that a lot of people don't start making revenue until year five. Right. Like it, it takes that perseverance. And that might mean you can't quit your job yet. That might mean you need to do it at the same time. And that doesn't mean you're a bad business person. That's just like how it goes in some industries. And so I think I think that's really important to know. So what would happen happen for your business for you and co-founder say, you know what, we did give her a best shot. It's not working anymore. We got to shut it down. Like what would have to happen? What would have to happen for us to decide to do that? Yeah. Um, I think we'd probably have to go several years without making any money because okay. the thing is we're very persistent people to a fault <laughs> like even if we weren't making money we'd probably get jobs and like continue to run the <laughs> business to see if we can wind it back up again <laughs> so I think it would have to go like a long time and we might even keep it on life support for like six years we yeah. might even just be like maybe we can take <laughs> like, off keep, again keep the domain, the website open you know don't close it <laughs> <up and> down <laughs> because that's the thing is the thing the way our business has worked is it's been very feast or famine and like we like for example we had a really really rough year one year where we were like not getting any deals we weren't making any money and then we closed a 1.2 million dollar deal and it was just like well glad we didn't give up you know like it, it can be very it can be very like hit or miss and it's worth our business just like keeping it open just to see who will reach out you know yeah. And like you just said, you made a one, two million dollar deal. Can you talk about this? A lot of people are seeing the news. So, so made this much money, but then you got to you know all the stuff you got to pay for. Right. So it's one million revenue, but probably not that much profit. Right. Well, it was tricky because like that year, unfortunately, when you make money, sometimes people try to sue you. And so that same year we dealt with this massive lawsuit by uh, basically someone was like, I actually, that's my IP and just this whole mess. We ended up winning. It's all good now. But uh, a lot of our money unexpectedly got spent on lawyers. Uh, so that was unfortunate. But we did we did make money. It, it wasn't that bad, but uh, but it was kind of bad. <laughs> So, so before, that was an unexpected expense. Yeah. Was this, you guys sued by someone you knew or someone like totally random? It, it was someone that uh, my business partner had known and uh, they kind of came out of the, came out of the woodwork and were like, Hey, you know, and it, it happens to businesses and um, uh, it's why people get things like business insurance, but we couldn't use ours in this specific case. And it's just, it's a mess. Yeah, but we're all good now. It's it's kind of behind us, and it's something that we know that can just happen, and we we know now how to better get our ducks in the row so that we can head that off in the future. So before you said you actually go to like the industry conferences for your company, like what kind of industry conferences would you all go to? Uh, all kinds. Like um, for games, the biggest one is like the Game Developers Conference (GDC). That's like the big one in the game industry. Um, there's also um, uh, conferences for standards bodies like Kronos Group and W3C, you know, they have their own conferences where they just talk about like web standards or graphic standards and, and that's the theme. Um, and then there's also uh, OSCON, like open source conferences. So there's there's a, there's a good medley of conferences that I kind of keep my eye on. So any ideas for another, any other type of companies? Uh I definitely want to expand my art business. Like I would love to do more what I used to do in digital art and do custom installations for people. I just, I, I realize that I'm not sure I'm the kind of person that can sell a bunch of things for $50. I think I like doing the bigger projects. I like doing the like more custom projects. So I think I might try going out to Brooklyn or Philly more and uh, try to try to just kickstart that. I think that it would be fun to get more clients in that space. So I hope I, I asked this right, but like, can you give advice to someone who's like the only person in the room, like the only female, only Hispanic, only whatever case you be like, you're the only one in the room, how you, how you navigate that? I feel like it's different depending on what kind of only person you are. I think I can only speak to the experience of being like the only woman in the room or uh, the only like queer person in the room, maybe. But uh, I, 
Gosh, that's really hard. It depends what the context is, really. Uh, like, for instance, if it's like a short-lived thing or if it's like a work environment that you just have to deal with every single day, I feel like those two things are different. Um, I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's not an easy situation to deal with. And there's unfortunately not an easy fix. For instance, like, it's not always easy to know who to avoid because you're the only person certain people will have bad reactions with. <laughs> they might be really nice to everybody else in the room, you know, and it's just, it's not an easy situation to navigate. And um, I think just acknowledging that and I don't know. I wish I had better advice. I feel like earlier in my career, I was a lot more like optimistic about that situation, but now I'm a lot more pessimistic. Like if I was the only woman in the room, I would either suck it up if it was like a short lived event. And I would just be like, get away from me, everybody. I'm going to say my piece and then I'm going to leave. Or if I, if I had to be in that environment long-term, like a company, I would try to get out. I would try to not be, I would try to just isolate myself and, and cope. <laughs> so I, I don't have the best advice. So in the past, have there been some advantages for you for being the only female in the room? Or like advantage where you better take advantage of it and, and for your own good? I don't know everyone yeah. always talks about the negatives of it. There, I mean, there's some advantages, but the negatives definitely outweigh them. And I think, I think a lot of people um, who haven't had that experience don't understand that. They're like, oh, but there's all kinds of like women in tech scholarships or like you know, don't they favor you to speak more or whatever, but there's always, the negatives always outweigh that. So I think those, those, um, those actions that are targeted toward women are really important because there's so many negatives that will always outweigh them. And, and it's important to offer those even more. And I, I kind of asked you this question before on a personal development, but like, how often, like how many hours per day per week do you spend like keeping up on tech stuff, right? Like you actually own the code yourself and keep up the data and code or you're past that point now? Oh, you mean like kind of educational yeah. uh, things? Well, I think there's two sides to that. I have to keep up with the business side of things. Like I have to kind of be in the know of like what mergers are happening, like who's like, what what's going on with the tech business? Like, are we going to be entering a recession? Like, are people hiring? Like what's going on there? And then there's the actual tech side of it as well. I think I don't spend a lot of dedicated hours doing that, but because of the people I interact with and what I'm surrounded by at work, it kind of naturally goes to me. And I will sometimes seek it out if I get a little crumb, like, oh, this business isn't doing so well. I'll kind of like research that and make sure I'm like informed. And all your companies that you do business with are you not in the United States? No, no, we do business with countries across the world. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so next, um, you talk some, but can you go to more detail, like how your company got started? What you focus on now, what your future vision for the company is? Yeah, so we got started in 2016, as I said, doing freelancing. Um, we would try to optimize people's apps and stuff like that. We eventually launched an image compression uh, product with um, Netflix's support. And then we started trying to make it an actual standard, meaning like, Lots of companies could trust that this was not going to change easily. It was moderated by a standards body, something like JPEG, for instance. And we just hosted the implementation of it. We continued to sell this closed source. So we, we kept all the code to ourselves. We just said, this is what the standard is. So you all know, but we kept the code to ourselves and, uh, and then sold it, licensed it to companies. And then eventually we got paid to open source it. And so we started making deals, improving the open source code. Now we're kind of ping ponging again and thinking maybe we should go back into some closed source products while maintaining this open source code and see what we can do. So we're kind of doing a hybrid approach now. So what's, um, let's suppose you have a client. Let me rephrase this. Suppose you had a client, everything's going well. What would make you say no to that client? Like they have the money, everything's lined up. But like there's something about the company that you would say no to. Like that is it based on your values? Like what's a red flag that we call you, okay, we don't want to work for this company? 
values have sometimes come into play sometimes for sure. Like, um, sometimes it'll be on a personal level. Like I'll go meet with them and they do not treat me well, like as a human being, like the numbers might all add up, but if they're going to be like that level of rude, like what is down the road, you know what I mean? So that, that can definitely be, um, uh, I think, I think relationships are really important in my business. We often work with companies for years, um, like years, and a lot of money is on the line and they have the ability to sue us into oblivion if they want to. And so the relationships are really high stakes. So I think I pay attention a lot to relationship and making sure that doesn't sour and making sure that um, that's something that we can actually like do over five years. How do y'all do customer service? Like, for example, are y'all available 24 seven or like cause stuff like that? Like how you make sure like you provide that great customer service at the same, like keeping boundaries around your personal life? It's a really good qu question. I think a lot of people reveal too much about their schedule to their customers. Um, like a lot of people are basically like, like almost treat their customers like a boss, like, oh yeah, I'm available nine to five, you know? And I, I try to basically make it clear that they're not our only customer. We have other customers. We're we like just because we work a certain number of hours or whatever doesn't mean we're always available because we might be working with another customer. So I try to purposefully obfuscate my schedule a little bit and not be too transparent about when I'm available. And then if they do want, we have a support contract. So if they do want like support, we will do that, but with very clear boundaries. And the only, we try to keep things to like, we'll respond in a reasonable time mm -hmm. instead of giving an exact date. The only case where we have exact date are like horrible bugs, like awful security nightmares. And then we, we will put a time limit on that. So from your point of view, what's been like the most fun for you about being an entrepreneur? I think the freedom. I think the freedom is the most fun. And the the thing is not everybody has that freedom. Like I know entrepreneurs that set up their business in a way where they are like chained to their desk. Like you can, you can definitely do that if you want to, <laughs> but in, in my business, I have freedom. I can take days off. I can take long vacations kind of, I, I still have to check my phone and email sometimes, but like, I don't have to be at a desk or at a location necessarily aside from a few times every year. Um, so that's really nice so each day how do you how do you make sure you focus on priorities one two and three versus priorities number ten thousand and one? Oh, that's hard it's hard especially because we're in a product development phase right now and we could build like 15 different products which one do we do and I think I really focus on where the money is coming like where can we actually get money and what customers do we actually have I also have, I, I keep a strict calendar of, you know, things we need to get done by X dates and those will obviously come first. And I try to stay really grounded in why we're doing this business, which is to make enough money to have the freedom to live the rest of our lives. We're not doing this as like a pure passion project to just like theoretically explore a lot of things. We, we have to stay grounded in what we'll sell. So how do y'all keep them? Um, I think it's called shiny object syndrome. How do y'all stay away from that? Uh, <laughs> my business partner uh, struggles with this more than me. I think sometimes I, <laughs> it can be very easy to like jump from product to product and be like, I want to do this or this. Um, I think being grounded in sales helps a lot with that. Like okay, this is a new idea. This looks cool, but is it just cool or can it actually make us more money than this other thing that we're working on? You know, and being very grounded. Okay, if this could make us more money, what's the time cost of, of switching to this? Like how much, you know, how is it really going to make us money if we take in, into account all the R&D that we're going to lose, like switching to it and just trying to stay very practical and grounded in that way. It can sometimes be good to switch and to pivot like sometimes it's bad to stay on the same path but i think you have to be practical about it what's been y'all's approach for as far as like sales and marketing and business development for the company uh in terms of 
it's changed, as I said, over the years. Uh, it used to be super social media based, like everything was social media. Like we got all our leads on social media, all our meetings on social media. Um, but we also have done a lot of public speaking and talks. My partner does a blog, so content marketing. Um, he does a highly technical blog where a lot of programmers will keep up on it and it gets on Hacker News a lot and it kind of spreads the word that way. Um, and then we also just try to do word of, word of mouth. We try to keep in touch with our customers, see if they know anybody who who might be interested and kind of do it that way as well. So there's all these um, like tech publications, like Hacker News, other ones out there, you know, there's hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. Is there one that you can recommend that you like to read? I don't like to read a lot of them. Um, what's a good one? Let me think. Keeping up on tech news. It can be really tricky. I think for me, if I ever want to get a good scan of like what's going on in the industry, I probably would look at conference recaps. Okay. Like I would see like what's being talked at at the conferences, like what are the talks this year? Like, what, and, and that's kind of like my go-to if I feel like I'm behind on what's happening in tech. I feel like that's usually pretty reliable. And so you say your customers, you stay with you for five years, five more years, five or your five more years, right? Yeah, my, our customers are long term. Like you, it's rare for us to get a customer and then only have them for like a month or two. It's usually years. Is that just where the contract's set up or the way the business model's set up or? Not necessarily. Like some of our contracts, like they can definitely um cut them short if they want to but usually they are investing a lot of money in us usually we are part of their system and they're using our tech and they're invested in continuing to use our tech and so usually it's a, a very long-term partnership and and they they work with us because they want to be using our product for the next 10 years well, as far as making money do y'all charge like on a monthly basis per project per hour like how do y'all actually charge I think it's evolved. I think now my current mindset is there's two kind of categories of pricing. There's product pricing and then there's like work that we do. Like for instance, we'll sometimes do contracts where we will improve our open source compressor. Um, and I think I usually charge a flat fee for that kind of work on the compressor type things as opposed to like an hourly fee. And part of the reason is that micromanagement and trying to avoid the clients, like making sure we work 40 hours a week. I kind of agree on like some goals, like what are we going to get done? And then for that, I kind of price it roughly on how many hours it might take us. But I also add buffer and things like that. And then I charge a flat fee for that. Um, and I found that that works really well for that work for higher segment. So pull out of your eight ball, what do you see like happening in the future of tech? Like what do you see happening with tech? Like big general ideas? It could go in so many directions, right? It's kind of interesting because there are little things that crop up like VR or AI that are like, but but they can also go away. Like they can be like, VR is a good example. Like, you know, there was a time where they were like, everybody's going to always be wearing a headset <laughs> and we're not going to take it off, right? And I think that it's important to recognize that there are like little like, you know, ideas like that that will come and go. Um, but I think, I think it, I, I'm seeing a lot of trends towards like mobile and web. And I think that will continue. Like, I think that desktop machines will become more and more niche and people will want more things that are lighter weight on the go. Um, not always relying on such like heavy equipment. I think that that will become more of a niche thing. Is there any crazy idea out there that you think is going to come true in the future? For example, I, I used to watch a show called Your Million. What episode? It had where like, you know, if you got, if you can't handle cancer, gave you a shot and the shot had robots, little tiny robots and little tiny robots would go into your body and like kill, kill the cancer cells. Right. Another episode where like, you know, you need, you never actually die. Like you download your consciousness to a computer. You'd always live in the cloud. So any crazy idea like that in the future you think is going to happen? I think there will be cool stuff with AR in the future. So augmented reality. So like you see things and then like, digital things can be like on top of those things. Like I, it's, it's difficult to imagine, but there's been some prototypes. And I think that that would be 
a really cool feature to kind of just like not necessarily always need a screen, but have have just it interacting with you as you as you watch the world. Do you think most people in America, or the world in general, realize how advanced tech is, or they just take it for granted? Like, do most people realize the phone we have now has more computer power than the moon landings, right? I don't think most people realize that. But you know what's interesting is that was true of the moon landings too. Like that's always going to be true for the present moment is like our technology is so much more advanced than it was in the past. That's That's been true for like 50 years now. And so I think, I think that... I think that it's true that it's a lot more advanced than it is, but I also think people are correct that it can be even more advanced in the future. And in many ways, like people are going to look back at us like, wow, you guys, you guys were so, so old fashioned. Yeah, so, I know, right? <laughs> so it'll keep progressing. So it's not necessarily wrong to be like, oh, this is basic because it might be basic 50 years from now, but it's yeah. also really advanced and really cool. Like both things are true. True. Like 50 years might have a chip in our finger that does everything for us, right? Phone calls, pay money, <laughs> you know, whatever the case may be, right? <laughs> you guys carried something a phone what is a phone like, <laughs> like you, you walk we never walk we float everywhere why did you walk for what's wrong with you yeah so and who like, knows? Who yeah knows? i don't people realize how far advanced tech has advanced like in the recent years either right i like i, I listened to one podcast and this guy was like I, I went from playing pong to like you know ai you know chat gpt in one generation right yeah, it's it, I mean, it's it's interesting. It's cool to follow because, you know, when you when you're in college, you kind of think like, OK, I'm I'm going to learn what I need to know and then go into the field. But tech is a, is a field that's constantly evolving and const there's constantly new stuff and new things to learn. So it's it's really interesting. Do you think tech can provide a solution to everything? I've heard people say tech can, can provide a solution for everything. I don't know if that's true or not. No, I think that people matter. And I, I'm really resistant to, for example, a lot of these trends with AI, where they will use artists work and, you know, say artists aren't needed anymore, because they've trained their AI to steal their art. And I think that's really messed up. I think it's still rooted in humanity. It's still rooted in the people that created those images that are being used. It's still rooted in the people who write the programs. And I think it's really important not to lose sight of people and not to lose sight of ethics. What do you take when people say AI is going to take all the jobs? I think that they're right to be mad and afraid of that. And that I think as programmers, we have a responsibility to not get too excited about AI. We have a responsibility to realize that AI can be really messed up and it can be used in really awful ways. And we we should try to write our tools responsibly and try to pressure our companies to not use it in unethical ways. And my thing is like, who's programming the AI, right? Are they, you know, are they ethical, non-ethical, you know? Like the, the yeah. AI is like, you know, if it's a messed up person programming, like who knows what's going to be done to it? That's exactly right. And it's also kind of like people will make the argument of like, well, those jobs aren't that good anyway, or they don't pay that much, but we don't have the social structure in place to give people income if they're not working those jobs. And so until we're, we have something like universal basic income or a way for people to support themselves, like they have every right to not want the AI to try to take their jobs. Like, absolutely. Yeah, I think a good example was like, you know, talking about, you know, drivers, trucks, taking over all the trucker jobs. Yeah. Like if you do it all at one time, like on one, like one random Monday, there's 250,000 people without jobs and the repercussions exactly. throughout the economy, right? It'd exactly. Be a disaster. And it's a mess. And a lot of people um, won't be able to find other jobs. They needed that job to live, to literally live and feed their families. And I think we're going to really need to think about that and also act on it on a political level as well. One thing, too, I think about tech people, I think a lot of tech people, they don't realize how slow it's going to take for this thing to implement it, right? Like, you know, like, like, like Uber has been around forever, right? Airbnb, like, but I know still many people like will not get a Uber, no to get an Airbnb, you know, those are for a while. What's the case? Uh, the, the uh, electric bikes, you know, were everywhere, you know, that really didn't go across, you know, across the nation, you know? So I think there's a lot of good tech ideas that just don't get implemented for whatever reason. I think it's true. And I also, I also see it like um, in the beginning of the pandemic, when a lot of people had to go to school online, it was really eye opening to me to see how many people, even in places like the Bay Area, which is like a tech hub, did not have internet access and and could not attend classes anymore. And I think I think it's definitely important for us to push 
the limits, but also to recognize that a lot of people don't have access to that technology. And we should definitely work on getting more access to it so that more people can be part of this. Yeah, I remember one time a couple of years ago, I went to visit a friend in the area, and he was telling me, and I didn't believe him at first, but but now I do, like, he was telling me like, that the internet there is like based in the 90s or 90s, like, hasn't been updated in forever, right? And they can't update it because of cost, the price cost. Like, so this is the most tech enabled place in the world, pretty much. And your internet sucks. He said, yeah, our internet sucks. And it just blew my mind away. It depends where you go to, you yeah. know, there's been projects around like Palo Alto and stuff, mm. I bet, that, that work on it. But yeah, absolutely. Like it's it's not a given that everybody has access to new tech for sure. Yeah, I remember when I, I went there, I had to get a, I had like a, I have a, but like a, I think it's called a BART card, like go around on, on the BART. But I, I lost myself, get a new one, right? So we're in a person and like, and they have fax machines, like, I just blew my mind. Like, this is like the tech capital of the world. Pretty much y'all have fax machines. Like it just blew me away. Exactly. And I think, I think like I deal with that a lot too. Like we always want to push people to have like the latest computers and the latest, you know, everything, but a lot of people have very old devices and very old computers and it's, it's for various reasons. And, and we have to make sure that we work with that and that we are patient with those customers as well. So for sure. Do you think, and this is a general question, do you think the tech community has done a good enough job as far as like, you know, uh, as value, as being like values based? No, the tech company is terrible at that. <laughs> the tech industry is terrible at that. Like we, uh, not enough people consider ethics, I think because too many people are just like afraid of losing their jobs. And so they don't want to speak out. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to make anybody mad who's an executive at their company. Everybody might be watching their social media. So I think there's a lot of people who aren't speaking their minds and aren't thinking about ethics enough. And it's it's not good. But I do think that there are some good things in the tech community. I think I like the ethos of open source. And I think that's actually really cool. Like it, it, there's a lot of, there's some not good aspects about that community, but there's a, th that's a really cool idea. And this idea that like anybody can use the software is, is actually really progressive compared to other industries that really like lock everything down under a patent and like nobody can use it kind of thing. So next question. So Twitter, before Elon Musk took over Twitter, I'll make this number up. They had like a thousand employees, right? Doing whatever they're doing. Elon Musk takes over. He pretty much takes tits to 80%. So the only 20% of the people are left and they're still doing the same stuff with Twitter, doing more stuff, right? So you think that's the case that like Twitter was overhired, just hiring people to hiring them? Or is it a case that Elon Musk like seeing the, um, I won't say the, the dead beats, but like the, um, oh, the, what's the word looking for? The um, overpriced developers, right? That question makes I... any sense. I'm not a fan of Elon Musk and I do not approve of the way he has handled the whole situation. I don't like his business practices. And I, I think that, sure, I, I see it all the time in the game industry, especially. They will think that they can hire half, fire half their staff and and still make a game in half the time and sometimes it works and sometimes they can eke it out but it's not a good idea and it's not any way to treat people and developers should be paid highly and maybe some people will work for less but that's bad for the health of the industry in general so i think it's a thin ice situation you might be skating now but when are you gonna fall through a hole you know yeah but you think the case could be made that some of those people were being paid for doing nothing like they're over, not overpaid like there's like maybe instead of having four people doing one this one job you only need two of them and still be productive maybe but also what's wrong if you have the money what's wrong with having four people manning that task especially if it's an, an important task that needs to be done i think you can make arguments for like oh there's too many cooks in the kitchen or there's it's not structured well but i don't think elon was going in with a strategic restructuring i think he was <laughs> just firing people who didn't like him essentially okay yeah. So you mentioned U UBI before. Do you think U U UBI is going to something that's going to actually happen in the future? I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> I, I people have been talking about it for a long time and it hasn't. Um, but I don't understand politicians. I don't understand the way they work. Um, all I can hope for is to help out, you know, small scale efforts like you know, food banks and giving money to people and, you know, trying to help in, in our community because who knows when the politicians are going to do anything, right? Yeah, politicians is like, this is my I thing, know. like, 
My they wish make is tech look good. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> like, did did you watch that that uh the, the congressional hearings where they like they interview the tech the TikTok CEO? Some of the questions asked, like, are you kidding me right now? Like, do you don't have I an know. intern in the twenties that could tell you to ask a better question? Like, did you do any research? Like, it's such an it, embarrassment. It's it's a mess. And so I have hope for small scale efforts. For instance, one good thing the tech industry did is in the beginning of COVID, this group of investors and people in tech got together and started this initiative. Um, I wish I remembered the name of it, but it was something like it was based around like one thousand or three thousand dollars. And they basically they they form this website that was based on referrals so that you weren't just giving money to a complete stranger. They were like vetted by somebody and it, they kind of like could grow their network via trusted referrals. And they were able to connect people in tech who had money to people who had lost jobs from the pandemic and give them money. And it was like a really okay. cool use of tech. It was almost like UBI, but like grassroots UBI. Yeah. And it was really, really cool to see. So there's, there's chance there's there's hope out there yeah for politics i did for somehow we could get people who are at least 60 years or younger to run for offices right instead of these 95 year old people you know i know but i mean there are people who are 30 who are awful people too so it's 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 a really yeah. tricky thing you know it's That's not true. unfortunately i don't think it's just an age issue yeah but at least like you're 30 years old you have your mental capacity right versus some of these people and you see in congress like are you even alive right now you know yeah, I don't know. I like I'm no expert. I hope I have my wits about me when I'm older, but who, you know, yeah. yeah. So when you also first started a company, like you didn't fundraise. So do you like did you bootstrap? You have personal savings coming in? Like how do you pay for everything in the beginning? We did a variety of things. Um we had our freelancing, so that was making us money. We had some degree of savings, but not a lot. We had like we could maybe be okay for like two or three months. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that to other people. <laughs> it's probably good to have more runway than that. Um, and then occasionally we would keep, continue to take contracts um, even after we started selling products just to boost our income a little bit. So we essentially bootstrapped with contracts and freelancing. And, and, and when you live in Seattle, were you a co-founder here in Seattle too? Or have you always been like in different locations? That's changed. Like right now we are both in rural Pennsylvania. Um, we moved out here. He moved out here first and I kind of followed him out here. We're really good friends. So we like living near each other just to hang out. But we've gone through periods where I was in LA and he was in Seattle and he was in Pennsylvania and I was in San Diego. And it's, it's, we've lived in different places. Okay. So is there anything I, I, I sort of asked that I haven't or anything else you want to talk about? Uh, no, I think, I think it's good. It's been a fun interview. Good. Yeah, thank you. So before we get out of here, can you give us, give us any last minute advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Um, just that, uh, anyone is free to reach out to me. Like you're, you're welcome to, uh, email me with, on my contact form, even though I haven't been super active on social media, I still check my emails and, um, I'm always happy to say hello and, and catch up. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.